Thank you. My name is Carla Dove, and um, I'm the program manager for the Feather Identification Lab, and I've been working here at the Smithsonian since um, 1989. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today um, about what happens when these beautiful feathered creatures that you see on the bottom strip of this um, slide collide with these big metal monsters that you see at the top of this slide, and a little bit about how the Smithsonian is involved in all of this. So as you can imagine, when a bird smacks into an airplane, there's not a whole lot left of the bird. But what you might not know is that hundreds of millions of dollars in damage are caused by birds every year to aircraft. No aircraft is safe. Um, this is a helicopter strike. We've had military um, aircraft strike. And recently, we have had bird strikes to our military drones. As long as birds and man have been sharing the air, we've had bird strikes. Orville Wright had a bird strike, and the first bird strike fatality was in 1912. I just want to point out here briefly that the Smithsonian Institution was established in 1846, so long before we even had invented airplanes, we were assembling these collections here that would one day be used to improve aviation safety. The Smithsonian became involved in this issue in the 1960s when there was a bird strike and a crash in Boston Harbor. Feathers were pulled from the engine and sent here to Roxy Laybourne, who identified the birds in that uh, accident as European starlings. And then Roxy began her pioneering work here in forensic ornithology. And what we mean by forensic ornithology is basically taking a feather or a piece of a feather and looking at the microscopic structures in that feather to determine what group of birds may have been, uh, may have, this feather may have come from. We do that by looking at a very specific part of the feather, the plumulaceous or downy barbs, and among different groups of birds, these have different morphologies, and then we are able to identify species. So an example would be the, the galliforms or the turkeys and the quails have a very different microscopic structure than the anseriforms, which are the ducks and the waterfowl. So by taking a, an unknown or a single feather or a piece of a feather, if you have the right microscopic characters, you can get that to a group, and then you take that whole feather out into a museum collection where you have reference specimens and match that up to make a species identification. We are so good at that because we have one of the best bird collections in the world. For those of you who don't know this, this is right upstairs here, six floor east wing, and we have around 620,000 museum specimens representing about 85% of the diversity of birds in the world. Our staff is now composed of four full-time employees, and we have various contractors who work part-time. We are funded through interagency agreements with the FAA, the U.S. Air Force, and the Navy, and we process around 9,000 bird strike cases every year. We have incorporated DNA barcoding into our toolbox now and we, so we can identify tissue and blood. And we uh, do this through the Laboratories of Analytical Biology, which is right here on the West Wing, first floor. Some of you may be wondering, why do we care what species of birds are involved? I mean, who, who cares? It's, it's nice to know, but what does it matter? Well, knowing the species of birds that cause these issues and cause this damage, then we know what the species does. When is it here? What's its distribution? What does it eat? Where does it live? Where does it nest? And knowing that information helps people on the airfields go out and manage the habitat or do something to the environment that may make that a little less friendly to the birds. So there are lots of aspects in aviation safety that actually depend on the species identifications um, for these uh, projects. We have some evidence that it's starting to work. We know that over the last 20 or 30 years, the number of bird strikes reported has been increasing, while over the last 10 to 15 years, the amount of damaging strikes, those that occur on the airfield, uh, airfield environment, have been decreasing. And this is all uh, revolves around the point when wildlife biologists were placed on airfields to start working on habitat management and wildlife control. This is in spite of the fact that large populations of birds have been increasing over the last 30 years. So we think something's going right. Um, just so you don't think that's all we do, uh, we also have worked and applied the feather identification technique to anthropological artifacts. We are looking at bioinspiration projects and feather altar structure. We uh, worked with some folks at the Frick, Freer and Sackler Gallery on Chinese jewelry. We've looked at 25 million year old uh, pieces of amber with feathers embedded. And most recently, we have started to work with the uh, folks at the Everglades National Park on the dietary analysis of Burmese pythons in the Everglades. And I apologize for putting this picture right before lunch, but 
um, if you clean the feathers up and you take them out into the museum collection, you can actually identify these species uh, that these snakes are eating. And so far, we found over 25 different species of birds that this non-native invasive python has been preying on in the Everglades. So you might be wondering, well, do we really need all of this morphological uh, expertise and comparisons in the future uh, now that we have DNA technology? And I would say absolutely yes. These are two examples that we worked on recently. These were crashes from bird strikes that depended on the morphological comparisons for species identifications. The case on the right is an air filter from an aircraft that had poor quality DNA. So we really, after several attempts, could not get DNA from, from the sample and had to rely on the microscopic characters and the whole feather characters. Uh, the case on the left was a crash that involved DNA barcoding, but there were overlapping decodes and uh, barcodes and species that were similar, and so we relied on the morphological evidence in this case for species identifications. So I think that the museums and in our program um, really supports two main functions of museums, and number one is to continue to train. We need to train the next generation of morphologists, whether it's in our program or whether it's in systematics and evolution. And we also need to maintain our wonderful collections here because we really don't know what the future holds for what we have here in our collections. Thank you. Question for Carla. I've, <laughs> okay. um, I've heard that uh, border collies are being enlisted to get geese off the mall in, in our great city. And I'm just wondering if you could say something about the ways that um, bird control around airports is now working with like these kinds of, of uh, ideas. Yeah, so the question was, um, sh she's heard that they're gonna use border collies to keep the geese off the mall, and I just recently heard that too. It's very effective, <laughs> um, and I think it's, you know, some of the, the wildlife management aspects that are being used on airfields are going to be you know, used in other parts of society now, like golf courses and, and other areas where people and wildlife come into conflict. Um, there are solutions, and I think that the border collie one has been shown to, to be very effective with geese, but not with other things like swallows or something else. So they may have to use something else on airfields. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's cool to have border collies running around the mall. <laughs> Uh, my, my question is, is about the uh, number of airstrikes. You say the air number of airstrikes, um, bird, bird strikes is going up, but the number of damaging bird strikes is going down. Um, does that mean that the, most of these airstrikes, the ones that are going up, are from smaller birds? Or are they hitting uh, small aircraft? That, um, what, 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 what's going on there? The question is, why, why is the number of bird strikes going up and the number of damaging strikes going down, and what's the cause of that? We think that the reporting is much better now in recent years for bird strikes. And so that's why after the Hudson River event and 1549 went into the river, we noticed a significant increase in the number of bird strikes we received for identification. So reporting is much better, and that's one part of it. But I also think that that really, that strong demarcation of when the uh, damaging strikes started going down was right after wildlife biologists were placed on airfields and able to implement habitat modification. Yeah, uh, this is a, over, over here. Hello. Question for the aptly named Carla Dove. Um, <laughs> uh, where are some other feather labs in the world? Is this the biggest one? Is there other ones? Do you have competition? How's that work? Other feather labs? Oh. Yeah. Where are the other feather labs in the world? There aren't any. <laughs> uh, actually, we are the busiest and most full-time, uh, fully dedicated to feather identification lab in the world. But there are other institutions and other places. Some of them, we have actually trained people. There's one in Israel. They're starting one up in the United Kingdom now. Um, there's Canada is just starting a program. So there are other places in the world where they actually do the bird strike identifications. 